to the Inner Core. My name is Paul Rauschenbusch, and I'm the Associate Dean of Religious Life and the Chapel at Princeton University. And I am very honored and pleased to welcome Professor Stanley Katz. You will quickly realize during this show that it's hard to say Stanley Katz is the blank, because Stanley Katz is so many different things, and all of them are extraordinary. He has the most varied career um, and has been celebrated in so many different situations that we're honored that he's here on the inner core today. Uh, Stan, welcome. Uh, Professor Katz, perhaps you can give us just a, um, a, a quick summary of your uh, career. We don't have um, the three hours this would take. So, so what I, I'm just curious. You, you know, you you got your PhD from Harvard. You were you undergraduate at Harvard. Tell me, starting out, what fascinated you when you were an undergraduate at Harvard? Like, what what really fired you? The way you see students today getting fired up. What fired you up at that time? You know, it was Harvard College was a wonderful experience for me. Uh, and I think it was because it was a unique moment in American higher education. It was right after the Second World War. Right. And many junior faculty who would have been further along in their careers were either just graduate students or junior faculty, and they were still living in the residential colleges. Harvard had residential colleges of the kind Princeton has only had for the last 20 years. And so for the three years that I was in one of the residential colleges, my closest friends on the whole were faculty or were these And perhaps faculty who had been involved in the war. That's right. So like tangible world experience, very interesting. That's right. They were older, but more than anything else, I think it was that they were intellectuals mm. and that they were spending time with undergraduates. And so very frequently, you know, uh, of a Friday evening or a Saturday evening, and we'd sit around and drink beer with um, people of, of that kind. And it was a remarkable opportunity for somebody like me because I found that I was intrigued by what they were doing. In, th in fact, I don't remember talking very much about the war, although they had been in the war. They were mainly pretty young. I don't think I knew anyone who had had uh, extensive experience in the war. But they were fully formed uh, uh, adults and, and intellectuals. And that was a heady experience mm. for, for a kid from Chicago. And mm. uh, so to me, I think that was really what was great about it. A lot of your work has been in the law, in cultural policy, in the Supreme Court. What, did that start right away? Did you, were you interested in the law when you were at? No. No. No, no, I really wasn't at all. I mean, as an undergraduate, I majored in a field uh, Harvard still has called history and literature. Uh huh. And I majored in English history and literature, but I was interested in the 16th and 17th centuries. And the reason I was, was that I was interested in how the modern world came into being and uh. it came into being, I think, in the late 16th century in some sense. And it was, you know, this confluence of, of religion and business and science and all of these things right. that, that uh, changed dramatically at about that period of time. And so the courses I took, actually I took some English history, obviously. I took no American history, which would be the hmm. field I did a PhD in. Uh, but I took a lot of courses in philosophy, literature. I was particularly interested in metaphysical poetry, hmm. um, political philosophy. I wrote my thesis on a radical political philosopher of the 17th century of the Civil War period. And it, so that's essentially what I was interested in. And so fast forward to today, which later on this month, we are having a whole symposium on you. Right. Isn't that astounding? Well, the I'm Woodrow right. Wilson School is doing an entire weekend on the work of Stan Katz and his contribution to the intellectual life of this country. So congratulations. Are there any particular um, panels that you're excited to see? Or maybe you've, you're just there to, to soak it on well, all I'm, in. I'm certainly there to soak it on. And if I expressed a preference, I would be in trouble. Oh, yes. So well, that's true. That's a good so point. That's so a good point. Do that. um, but but how did you get involved in your work in cultural policy? Because that, I think, is really, like, I think all, what you described in undergrad, your undergraduate and then later in, in history, I think what, we're, what you're, you're involved in is, is also looking at the history of culture and the law. And I, and I want to I ask you something that um, we talked a little bit about. When, when we look at the way culture um, 
and and sometimes religion are intersecting these days. Um, particularly, you know, if you think of the most the highest flashpoints, some of the the Danish cartoons, um, uh, some of you know some of the w uh, theaters that have been shut down because mm. uh, they're um, they're play is objectionable to the Sikh community. This happened in, in London. London right. um, I'm wondering how uh, do you see um, this? It, see, it sounded like you were describing some of the Enlightenment period, or, or maybe it wasn't clear. I mean, no, it's it, earlier, earlier than that. Yeah. But how, how does that inform what we're wor wrestling with today, which is our very like religion, culture, um, and the law coming into direct conflict mm. with one another? Well, of course, I mean, I never thought of it, frankly, in those terms. but those were issues in the period I studied, in mm -hmm. the, particularly in the 17th century, because the, uh, that was the era of the Civil War and the Glorious Revolution, and for instance, the theater was a central site uh. for, uh, for political conflict um, during the period, uh, and poetry itself was, I think, a site of cultural conflict. Now, I wouldn't have described it that way in the 1950s when I was mm. when I was doing this. It's a long mm. time ago. No, but uh, actually I think my interest in cultural policy per se doesn't come from that experience. It comes from my experience as the president of ACLS, the American Council of Learned Societies, which was a job I had in from 1986 to 1997. And ACLS is the National Organization in the Humanities. Yeah. But those years, if you recall, were the years of the culture wars. That's right. And ACLS, as the humanities organization, mm. was front and center in the culture wars. And I, as the president of ACLS, was one of the spokespersons for <coughs> people who believed in the, in the integrity of culture mm. and who were accused of undermining cultural values, religious values, uh -huh. political values. And so, having had the, you know, the responsibility of trying to articulate what it was we were doing and why it was uh, appropriate and democratic and scholarly, things that weren't obvious to some some people at that time, focused me um, uh, resolutely on questions of cultural policy. I had to think about them. So, ever since then, I have. And when we when I came back to Princeton, then we formed a center to study those problems. And how do you see that? I mean, it, it, uh, th those may have been the days of the culture wars, but some would say that those wars never ended, and we're still in them in some places, uh, even in a sense more extreme than than originally, uh, in the sense that the stakes seem very mm. high. Uh, I actually uh, don't, I don't really think that. I mean, no. I think that that um, the culture wars were a media war, and the media war is over. That's really what the cultural wars were about. But the history of America is a history of culture wars. Mm, so I right. would say we're back now to the o the ordinary, the ongoing uh -huh. culture war, uh -huh. and uh, that's never going to end. Uh -huh. And uh, the, the you know this, the terms of expression change, the the uh, the parties to the conflict change, the sites change, but the controversy goes on. And how how do you balance this idea of like respect for the other, respect for others' beliefs, and freedom of expression? This uh, are sometimes uh, in tension with uh, critiquing those same beliefs. Is there a is there a place where you stand, or is there a place where you feel like cultural as a whole can contain that discussion? Well, of course, you know. All parties to disputes of this kind believe that they are right and believe that they are listening carefully to the other side, mm. and, I, and I do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't think I don't have a carefully defined position, which makes me different than some parties to, right. uh, to the dispute, and whether it's political or cultural or religious. Uh, on the other hand, I, you know, what most of us rely upon, I think, is essentially the First Amendment tradition. That mm. is what's Almost everybody is committed to the view that what counts is allowing everyone to have a full and uninterrupted say. The pressure points come when the issues are so close to the bone that a variety of people don't feel that they have the luxury to do that, that their, mm -hmm. their interests, their commitments are threatened, and that uh, sort of open discussion is really no longer appropriate. Uh, and those are the moments uh, of crisis in the society. Now, I don't think we're at anything like that mm -hmm. point in this country uh, right now. And do you think that's because of the, our, our Constitution and uh, that protects it? I mean, do you think well, that... Well, I think to a very considerable extent it is. I mean, uh -huh. I think we, we genuinely have a 
free speech tradition. This, by the way, is one of my oldest scholarly interests. My first book was on the trial of John Peter Zenger, which was the uh, first famous case in America, 1735, relating to freedom of speech. Mm. Uh, that was newspaper uh, speech in that case. So that's been an interest of mine for a very long time. So I would say the tradition goes back to the 18th century. It's not even to the Constitution. Mm. Um, and it's really essentially uh, uh, an English tradition which we have carried on and broadened so that it's now broader in the U.S. than it is in the U.K. For me, that's the context for all of this. And I think, on the whole, our record is pretty good with egregious exceptions. You know, there was McCarthy. There was the Red Scare after World War I. Mm. Um, there is uh, vilification of people of various kinds even now. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed a news report yesterday about a man in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Uh, someone has just gotten a Ph.D. in... Uh, in anthropology, or I guess archaeology, probably, and uh, he has a theory about early life, and perfectly appropriate as far as one can tell. I forget what 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 form pre-human form he studied, but it turns out he is a, an advocate of uh, biblical literalism. Ah. Now, I, I take it the dissertation can be read without knowing that, and the science is fine. Now the dispute is. Uh, should that be uh, an appropriate scholarly production, knowing that this man is Has a that. literalist? Uh, yeah. It's a wonderful example, it seems to me, of you know, where we go wrong. Huh. Uh, if I understand it correctly, science is science, and insofar as he's applied scientific methodology, uh, he needs to be defended. Yeah. If he interprets it in a biblical way, then it's a different kind of problem, and I think it can be challenged on normal. Uh, yeah, open to challenge. Right, right. But those are the kinds of, and you know, there aren't very many countries in which, for instance, that sort of uh, religious challenge, say, to science, uh, it happens more frequently in this country. So mm -hmm. that's part of our tradition too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What would you say are just maybe two or three highlights of your career? Obviously. For decades to come, you will be contributing <laughs> to the 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 the, um, the world of the academy. But I'm wondering if there are any highlights that you would like to lift up when you think about your career, like a moment where you were particularly proud, or a moment where you were particularly challenged by um, something and and realized oh, that makes me think in a whole different way. Because I think those those moments uh, don't happen every day. Um, but I think in a career such as yours, I think uh, we can. We can lift those up and, and be thankful for them. So, uh, what is sure. uh, what's uh, can you think of anything either at Princeton or a anywhere else? That well, I, you know, I don't know that I've ever had uh, what I would call an aha uh, intellectual moment. Uh, I think that I'm the kind of person who learns gradually and slowly. Uh, um, and my ideas, I would say, have evolved more than mm. changed in a revolutionary fashion. No, I mean, I think for me, the the great moments are more uh, events uh, mm. and opportunities. And one was uh, the the opportunity to be president of ACLS mm. because it was a chance to move. I've always been the kind of person who cared deeply about uh, what happened at the national and international level, but most of us never get the chance to do anything about that. That's right. And so all of a sudden I moved from being a professor here, which previously had been my greatest opportunity, mm -hmm. um, to leading this very large uh, not-for-profit organization that had both uh, national and international responsibilities. Mm. And I think that was a heady, uh -huh. a heady feeling, and I will always be very grateful to have the chance to do that. And by the way, it, it was partly, uh, some of it not pleasant. Um, the culture wars I found very unpleasant, yeah. although it may have been the most important kinds of thing I did. My greatest um, accomplishment there, I think, was supervising the uh, commissioning and writing of what's called the American National Biography which is now 28 volumes long, uh, 18,000 biographies. It's both in print and online, and it's, it is the National Biographical Dictionary. Now, of, of, of them all Americans, but the, uh, you can't yet be in it yet because when people write to us and ask how they get in the book, we send back a postcard saying, drop dead. Ah, very nice. Okay, I'll work on that. Let me work on that. <laughs> no, but so, I mean, it's things like that that are great opportunities. Uh -huh. um, maybe, and I'll give you another example. Um, I had an opportunity in the late 80s and early 90s working with a small foundation in New York to begin um, uh, 
cultural uh, activity in Vietnam before normalization of mm. relations between the U.S. Uh, and Vietnam. And uh, we worked there for about three years, four years. And I think it made a marginal but real contribution to the possibility of normalization of relations there. Again, that's the kind of thing that most of us dream about being able to do. I mean, it's never going to get recorded in the history books, but it might be worth a footnote yeah. Um, yeah. somewhere. I am, by the way, at the moment trying to do the same thing in Cuba with absolutely no success. Mm -hmm. But, I, you know, I think for anybody who uh, wants to think a little bit out of the box, what counts is the chance to try something. And, mm. and I guess that's what I'm most grateful in, for in my career is that I've had more than the normal chances to do something different. Right, right. That's a great uh, place to stop for a moment. We're going to take a brief break, and uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about some of uh, Professor Katz's work um, on a class that happened last year called The Just University. So uh, uh, we're going to take a moment's break and be right back with uh, more on with Stan Katz on the Intercourse. Associate Dean of Religious Life in the Chapel at Princeton University. Again, welcome back to Professor Stan Katz, and welcome to Drew Frederick. Frederick. Frederick, yeah. Drew Frederick, who is a class of 07, mm -hmm. graduating, but who was very instrumental in a class that I want to talk about today, which was called the Just University. Now, how did this class? If, you know, come to being because this isn't something you taught before. This no. is a new class. No. So how did it come to being at the Just University? I find this fascinating. Which Good. was it? Was it you who started it, or yeah. you? Or it's, so it's it's a student initiated seminar, which is wow. a special course that Princeton University has for students who are interested in a certain topic and are able to find a professor who's willing to teach mm. and able to teach that topic. And so it really not the course, but the idea for the course was an evolution three or four years ago, really, mm. when I was involved in something called the Civic Values Task Force, right. which was started by Princeton Project 55, and a group of alumni decided to launch an initiative called the Civic Values Initiative, and they formed seven undergraduates, and we went around to peer institutions of Princeton right. and wrote a report. I remember this. That's and right. so after the report, we had really hoped to integrate civic engagement in some way, in some capacity, into the curriculum. Yep. And so... So did you approach uh, Professor Katz and say, we have this idea, we really would like to uh, promote at least the discussion right. and the, a and the a academic study mm -hmm. of what it looks like. So what is a just university? Let me put it out there. Uh, either one of you can, <laughs> you can say, well, what's a just university? And is Princeton one? Well... <laughs> uh, let me say just one word about it. Yeah. Uh, I got interested in that particular question because one of our PhD, former PhD students, who now is at Texas A&M, huh? asked me to give a lecture on that subject wow. in honor of some anniversary mm -hmm. of the university. So I, I wrote a lecture on the okay. subject, mm -hmm. but it was a generic uh, right. lecture, not about any particular university. Uh -huh. And I think probably I passed that along he to did. Drew and some of his colleagues. And you that's know. how you kind of thought... Well, that's the that's the course. That was one of one of the sparks, and mm. I sent an email to Professor Katz that was three or four pages long, mm -hmm. somewhat incoherent, I believe, and he responded back in capital letters, "Wow," yeah. which is unusual for Stan to respond mm. that way. <laughs> He's like, "Let me think about it." Wow can be both good and bad. Right. I think the <laughs> wow can be like, "Let me buy some time." <laughs> so, so tell me, what were what were some of the things that came up in the class? I mean, what were, I mean, what, what are the criteria by which we can judge if a university is just? I should say, by the way, that we worked out a syllabus together. Drew and right. I uh -huh. spent a summer, parts of the last summer, thinking about this. And so the syllabus we had both was intended to 
give students background reading on what is justice, yeah. you know, more generally. Mm -hmm. But then we did some um, the structure of universities so that students would have a broader mm -hmm. notion of all of that, particularly in view of the history. And then we picked out a series of special topics. What, what topics? We ended up, we really wanted the students to have the inputs. Yeah. And because there's so many issues you could look at when mm -hmm. you talk about what is a just university. And so we wanted the students to really be the drivers behind that. And so what we ended up doing is the last four weeks of class, after we had grounded it and the history of the modern university, understood the structure of it, we had the students select topics that they were really interested in. And so things like affirmative action, um, things such as how should a university treat its workers, yep. how should a university treat its surrounding community, yeah. state, the nation. And so it really depended upon what students wanted to discuss. How many students about. were in the class? There were 11. There were 11 students. And yeah. so they each, each had to present. Uh, each one wrote a term paper yeah. on one mm -hmm. uh -huh. problem. For instance, there we had two uh, women who were athletic team captains. Mm. And wow. each of them wrote a paper relating to athletics and justice in the university. So mm. it was a really wide range yeah, of yeah, topics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what did you learn? Oh, a tremendous amount. Yeah. Because well, all say what you worked on. I, I worked on specifically, I looked at, and this is also a reason why it's difficult to say what is a just university, because we didn't just look at Princeton. We didn't just look at Ivy League schools or elite private institutions. Sure. We looked at public universities as well. And so m my individual paper and my presentation was more on public universities and how they should respond to undocumented immigrants and whether, specifically, whether they should offer them in-state tuition. Wow. And, which is was this a w and this was something that was, uh, is, are universities in New Jersey wrestling with this question? Oh, they are. Yeah. And at the moment there, there's a bill that I think over the past couple of years has been presented to the legislator, but there has, no action has been taken on it. So at the moment it, it really varies between institution, between community colleges. Right. Mm. And and the, the justice question here is, is it fair to force a resident uh, who is an undocumented uh, person to pay uh, at a higher rate than a resident who is a citizen or a legal resident of mm. the state of New Jersey or any mm. other state? Mm. And those were the kinds of questions we, we focused yeah. on. It really gets, I mean, it's, it seems like the moment you begin to look at this question, you just start going, Peeling the onion, no, and that's right. but what is but but peeling the onion, is there a core? Like how does how does a university or how does any well let's stick with the university? How do you get to the core and decide? Yes, this is actually the intention of this is justice. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there is there uh, do you think universities at their core have an intention of being just places, or are they are they more interested in the um, accumulation and production of knowledge? No, of course, well. we, we, we talked about it. Talked answer, about in one question. <laughs> <laughs> I want an answer. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I, one, a distinction I made in the paper that we talked about in the class is between procedural justice and substantive justice in the university. So procedural justice is sort of easier to deal with. We expect universities to be fair to their students, mm. to their uh, to their employees, mm -hmm. to their faculty, and pretty clear what some of those problems are. For right. instance, are, are uh, blue collar workers at the university getting paid a decent wage? Right. Are they compensated fairly? That's yeah. a justice question. Yeah. But that's a procedural question. But then there are bigger questions, such as uh, you know what the university research focus is and how that right. relates. Should a university be devoting its research energies toward solving the problems of the world or more focused on whatever it is scholar think, scholars think are the problems of most interest right. to them. Right. You know? And so connection to, for, for instance, the University of Wisconsin with you know doing work on um, uh, military technology, okay. which was the, mm -hmm. you know, the cause of mm -hmm. much uproar a, in the 60s. You know, that was true at Princeton, too. There was a, uh, a military math facility here, mm. just like the one in Madison, Wisconsin. Interesting. Interesting. And I should mention to the, to the viewers that uh, yeah. we were both resident at one point in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, indeed, but indeed. <laughs> the, the, the rumor has it that there were poker games that my dad lost a lot of money okay. to uh, Professor Katz, yeah. but we won't talk no, about that now. 
I have a final question for you. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that Princeton University is on the right trajectory in answering the question of just university? I would say absolutely. And I would say even I can notice it over the past four years, I feel, and there's a different tenor. And I think a lot of it starts really from the presidential leadership of Shirley Tillman, mm -hmm. even upper administrators like Vice President Dickerson, who really feel that Princeton is doing well in terms of how it treats people internally and even externally, but I think it also realizes it can do a better job, and it has that and its strategic vision moving forward. And so I do feel that it has improved tremendously. And I can think of an example very concretely of the Pace Center, which when I first got there was a very different mm -hmm. uh, center from what it is now. Mm -hmm. It has grown enormously and really provides a way for students right. who have creative, innov innovative ideas about how they can create social change, and the Pace Center works with them and tries to implement mm -hmm. those ideas. So what about from the faculty side? I mean, do you feel like there, there does, do, do faculty feel any uh, responsibility to make sure, that, um, to, to look at their research and say, this is um, applicable in a, in a positive uh, world bettering sort of way, or is that, is that uh, merely uh, sort of nonsense to be, uh, to be, to think about. <laughs> to think about. I, I think lots of faculty feel that way, but I mean it's true here, it's true anywhere, I think that there isn't a faculty point of view, it's a faculty that's diverse and re sure. reasonably large, and it probably uh, differs somewhat according to field and so mm -hmm. forth, mm -hmm. but I mm -hmm. think there are a substantial proportion of faculty who really do have a commitment, it's defined in different ways for many people doing justly is uh, reflected in the way you teach, whatever the subject is. Mm. Uh, for others, it's a combination of that, but also your research, because yeah. the product of your research, mm -hmm. mine is on human rights. Mm. I think it's a pretty close fit. <laughs> but, it, it's also, but it's also a topic right, that I right, have right, an right. academic and intellectual interest in, and I wouldn't be the last to deny that. So I think what every university is looking for is some sort of mix of those two, right. two things. It seems to me that um, Princeton University had a reputation nationally for a country club uh, environment, whether that was ever legitimate, mm -hmm. which I, I don't it think it, I don't think so. But it seems to me very clear now, both the faculty and the students are, and the entire staff is so dedicated to creating an, in, a, an environment where, that where people can really focus on questions that are applicable and crucial for our day-to-day mm -hmm. -day and for the world's um, sure. continued uh, cooperation and existence. So mm -hmm. thank this. the class sounds wonderful. Perhaps it will be offered again. Special accommodation to you, Drew, for yeah. really making it happen. Uh, and, and, uh, and that's the kind of you know, great students that we have at Princeton and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll continue to draw from. And so congratulations and well done. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we are out of time. It is, uh, has been a real pleasure to have both Professor Katz and Drew Frederick here with me. Uh, until the next time, uh, take care. Again, my name is Paul Rauschenbusch, and this is all for now from the Intercourse.